Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Even in the heat of the summertime, people still find time to garden and even plant things. But the question is, what do you do in the summertime when it comes to gardening? Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a guest we've had many times on the program before when we've talked about such things as giant garden vegetables and growing. How to grow, where to grow, what to do, and how to do it all organically. Everybody seems to be greenwashing and throwing organics all over the place, but this is the real deal here. And I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Roland Evans. And Roland, thank you for joining us here on the program again. Uh, It's always a great pleasure, Daniel. You bet. Now, is it corn season? Is this when we plant corn, or are we too late for that? Uh, we're a little late for corn. Corn is a, you need to be planted a little earlier if you're going to get corn. Best to get it from your farmer's market, um, and nice and fresh at this moment. Uh, you won't be able to get it by the end of the season. <laughs> now, a lot of people equate summertime, obviously, with the heat and the dryness and, and mm-hmm. even drought, for that matter. So let's talk about summer and your experience when it comes to gardening and potentially even growing things. Well, you know, this is a strange summer here in Colorado. We've been having so much rain, it isn't at all like summer. So uh, I'm going to have to put my mind into some of the other (laughs) summers, you know, that we've been having in the past. Uh, But yes, in different parts of the country, of course, they have different uh, climates, and they need to adjust to whatever their environment is around. But basically, unlike the spring where you're worried about the cold, In the summer, you're worried about the heat and the dryness. And also something which people forget, too, the ultraviolet rays. Um, These are the rays which are part of the spectrum, and they can actually do quite a lot of damage to not only your plants, but also to your soil. So you need to take care of your soil and take care of your plants by cutting down as much as they need. Uh, Different plants need different amounts of light and uh, different amounts of heat, and we can talk about that as we go along. So uh, where would you like me to start then, Daniel? Why don't you just go ahead and take the rain, as I'm not really much of an even novice uh, gardener. Right. I wouldn't even know where to begin. So, Well, let me tell you about what's happening in my garden. Um, actually, I've got most things growing nicely, but I did get behind. And this is one of the things which, as a gardener, it's very easy to do, which is you do your main planting you know, all the way up until June, and then everything's growing so fast that you start to relax. You start to think, okay, now I'm just waiting for my harvest. I've, I've got my <laughs> salads, you know, I've got my lettuces, and I've got my radishes, and everything's growing nicely, and the tomatoes are coming along, and I'm just relaxing. And actually, that's the wrong thing to do if you want to keep eating. Mm-hmm. The main thing to do is to think in terms of blocks of about two or three weeks. And even though it's difficult to actually replant about every two or three weeks, like... um. For instance, I did peas very late in the season, and I'm just having some very lovely snap peas now at the moment, which in July is actually quite unusual. So those were pl- those were planted like in May or June, no, about May, I think. Um, and in order to get those snap peas, I have what's called shade cloth. Now, shade cloth is this great stuff. It's very uh, reasonably priced, and you can get it off the web in many places. And you can get it in different uh percentages of shade. I tend to use a 40% shade. You can get it woven or knitted, and I prefer the knitted because if you make a hole in it, it actually doesn't unravel. And basically, you just drape it over your plants, you know, supporting it a little bit, and it cuts down the value of the heat and light by about 40%. And that way, you can get what's called your cold weather crops, uh, not your hot weather crops, which I'll come on to in a minute, but your cold weather crops, and those you can actually continue to grow. That'll be your salads. That'll be things like your root vegetables, including uh, carrots and maybe turnips, if you like those, kohlrabi. Um, it's a little late now to be planting peas. Uh, you might not get those, but you'll get your all of the salads and your greens. You can do your broccolis, and you can do um, you know some of what the cabbage family. Any any questions about any of that? <laughs> no, not so far. <laughs> okay, all right. So, you know, that's one of the things you think about is like how do I actually mitigate or, or turn down that volume of sun that's coming? And the simplest, as I said, is, is to use some shade cloth um, and just, as I said, drape it over your plants. And you can get some plants, um, you know, really nice uh, green, if you like, plants in the summer where you wouldn't expect them. 
The other thing that you have to think about, too, is, as I said before, is about protecting your soil. Mm-hmm. And there's many ways to do that, but the most important thing to do is mulching. And I don't know if you've done much mulching, Daniel, have you? No, not mulching, not too much. All right. You know, some people think of mulch as, it's, you know, that kind of ground up, kind of bark looking stuff, and you stick it around your plants, and uh, the weeds don't come up too much. I mean, you see it everywhere. And that's really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about anything which you can put that's organic, which will actually protect your soil. So leaves or compost are the most important ones. But even pe- some people I know will put actually torn up uh, pieces of newspaper as long as it's black and white. And what's that doing is it's stopping the moisture rushing away, if you like, from the top of the soil, okay. drying it out. It's stopping those ultraviolet light from getting at the soil and killing off the microbes in the top half to one inch of the soil. And it's basically cooling your roots. Um, Most people don't think about this, but even on a tomato plant, if the roots get above a certain temperature, the plant will start to suffer. Even though the tomato loves the sun, a lot of people, you know, they plant it in a pot or something and everything's going well and then it gets really hot and they're just wondering... Well, I'm watering it, but it's still looking kind of miserable. And it's miserable because its roots are too hot. Uh, Are you a tomato grower? Well, to be honest with you, I'm trying to get into gardening. I just haven't in many, many years, but I work with houseplants, so that's about as far as I've been. Ah, right, right. Yeah, well, you know, tomatoes are the most popular vegetable stroke fruit in the whole country. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, I don't know how many millions of those poor little plants are stuck in the ground every year, and I don't know how many of them die, too. (laughs) Probably quite a high percentage. But, you know, they're a hardy, tough plant, and um, they will always do their best to give you, you know, a good crop if they can, if you treat them well. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they've grown their tomatoes for a little while, start to get a feel for it and, and know how to look after them. But there are a few kind of things that you need to be thinking about, particularly when it's hot. One of them is that actually a tomato plant will not set fruit uh, if the temperature is over 85 degrees. So there are times in the summer where you'll have these little flowers on your tomato plant and it's up like 95, 100, and you're wondering, well, you know, the flowers just keep dropping off. And that's basically because it's too hot. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep those roots cool particularly and sometimes misting the plant uh, with a fine spray. That will help it cool down, shading it a little bit, particularly in the afternoon. People don't don't realize, but it's the afternoon sun, which is a killer. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when the sun is somehow coming from the west, it seems to actually have a lot more heat. We all know that, you know, the hot house in the the end of the day. Right. Yeah, and so your your tomatoes don't like that very much either. So you, you wanted to keep them warm, but not too warm. And you wanted to keep the actual roots moist and warm but not too hot and then you'll start to see you know your plants growing nice and big Uh, and there's another task which actually i find a little tedious in the summer with my tomatoes but it's actually very important to do it which is plucking out the little shoots um so there's two kinds i I, i'm just kind of going on you just better stop me daniel if uh, (laughs) No, you're doing a great job. It's just right. very well, intriguing to listen to, you know, such, it seems like common sense as you listen to it, but right. you realize, but nobody's ever really talks about it quite I like know, this. You, you plant it in the ground, you keep it watered, and, and you wait for food, and yeah, I, mean, I can yeah. see how it's a little more dynamic than that. Well, it's, it's not only dynamic, it's much more interesting. That's the thing about gardening, which is, you know, I've been gardening all my life, and I have to say, I still consult my gardening books. I still talk to people about it. I learn something every month. I learn something different, you know, just uh, just little hit, you know, tips and hints and how to do things. And as you learn those things, you get a much better sense, a kind of connection with your plants. Mm-hmm. And that is really what you're looking for. The better you're connected to your plants and your soil, the better gardener you are. But you know, I was going to bring something up, Roland, because you're talking about plants. Let's just even go with just tomatoes, just to stick it basic for a moment, that mm-hmm. people go out and they buy the plants uh, from particular places. And we had talked uh, on the program before about seeds and how 
they genetically engineer seeds to grow a plant, but then mm-hmm. that's the end of it, whereas you want to be able to grow a plant that can keep bearing seeds that you can keep using so it gets right. back to its original state. Yeah. And one of the things we talked about, I remember, was tomatoes. And I thought to myself, when was the last time I remember having a tomato, for instance, taste the way I remember mm-hmm. as a kid versus what you see in the store? They just they even right. feel dead. And now they've even got them, you know, where they still have part of the uh, the vine stock on them to make you believe, oh, this must be really organic. Right. But it's all right. the same thing. So what does a person do there? I mean, are well, these you know, plants I, I that they're have... buying of that genetically engineered right. quality? Or, right. or let's talk about that for a minute. Well, you know, this is a huge subject, and actually, it's it's a it's really big subject here in Boulder at the moment. Um, you know, what's called GMO seeds, genetically modified organisms. Um, they're planting on the open space. They're planting um, genetically modified sugar beet, and uh, well, there's a whole lot of cry about that. This is the stuff I that's can used believe that <laughs> Roundup, you know, and I don't. Well, it's it's kind of unclear why they're doing that, but basically, Monsanto, some of the bigger companies. Um, they've they've kind of trying to get a a, a, um, a monopoly of seeds, mm-hmm. and as I said before, this is a dangerous thing because you never want to have only one kind of seed or one kind of seed manufacturer. You want to have lots and lots, and diversity is what makes actually a gardening is such an interesting thing. If you don't like one variety, try another. Mm-hmm. But back to the tomatoes, I I don't know if you go to your organic store like a, a Whole Foods or whatever because that seems to be the only place left now actually. <laughs> but uh, do you go to like an organic store like that to to pick up your tomatoes? We do, but you know it's kind of interesting because I see them. This is just my opinion, overpricing things, and the quality is uh, maybe a little bit better, but to me, isn't too far from just your regular store chains. Well, that's exactly what I was coming to. Is I don't know if I talked to you before about what's called BRICS level. Okay. BRICS no, level I don't believe is, you did. Yeah, BRICS level is a way of checking what's called the sugar and nutrient density of a plant. Uh, it's a, quite an old, old way, actually. They've been doing it with vines and grapes for many, many years. And you can get a very simple little instrument called a refractometer, and you put a little drop of the sap, and it basically tests how many minerals and how much sugar is in that. And you can look at the scale, and it will tell you, oh, you know, a tomato is meant to have something like a, a four bricks level. Now, I did some testing with this just last year with my own against, actually, let's say, a, a well-known organic store brand of uh, good tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, my homegrown uh, tomatoes, and these weren't even, I wouldn't say my best quality, were over double the BRICS level of those ones you can get in an organic store. Wow. So you're looking at half the nutrient value in a tomato that you buy from a store. And I would say that some of those tomatoes have even less than that. I mean, they're, they're mostly just water. Cause they don't, exactly, they don't and that's what I was going to say is the taste, too. You don't hardly see much of a tomato seed inside of them. They're not that that's deep right. red sort of a sour, sort of, you know, mm-hmm. that, that tomato thing. And like I said, when we talked about it last time, I thought, you know, he's right, and I really try to find something, but it seems yeah. like it just doesn't get any better. I'm afraid it doesn't, and uh, we have given up, actually. The only way, if you go into the store and you're wanting to check your tomatoes, the only way to test, as far as I'm concerned, is you pick up your tomato, and you know where the stalk end is, you smell it. Mm-hmm. And if you cannot smell that tomato smell, there's not going to be any tomato taste. It means it's <laughs> that not giving off. To me. It's, tr- it's true, you know, you just no, won't have that. the taste. And, you know, they, you'll see me, and I pro- they probably don't like me, going around the tomatoes, smelling each one, thinking, no, that's no that doesn't smell like anything. Mm-hmm. They're picked unripe, that's the main issue. And that's why if you grow your own, you can, you can really uh, have such an amazing flavor. You know, now, this is tomatoes. also the time of the year, too, for watermelon. And I always get a kick out of how people decide how they find the right mo- melon. And I remember yeah. an old guy many, many, many years ago in Northern California says the best way to pick a good watermelon is look for the ones with the most bug tracks on them because those uh, are going to be the sweetest. Uh, that's <laughs> a good idea, right. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that you do with fruit is that you look for weight. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they always say that uh, if you think about, well, the more taste, the more minerals. 
So the heavier, that means the more they've got in that thing, the more likely it is to have taste. So that's a very, very uh, simple rule of thumb when you're looking at um, fruit and vegetables in the summer. But now, that, now we're talking about tomatoes now. Are there other vegetables or even certain fruits that you can plant in the summertime that can thrive? Well, you know, now is still the time to be planting beans. Mm-hmm. Beans are okay. a wonderful crop. You know, the, the, they say there's the three summer crops. There's corn, beans, and squash. Okay. Um, if you had some squashes which are actually quick growing, you could still plant them and you'd get a, a late season. You might not be able to do your winter squash. Those are the hard ones, you know, which will go through the winter. Uh, butternut and pumpkin and things like that. But you can certainly get your summer squash because they're a really fast-growing thing. And beans, you can still do beans because they're, they're a short crop. And when you buy a seed, most seed packets, and actually when you're buying online particularly, it'll tell you how many days to maturity. And that will be able to give you like, so if I plant it now, then I know when I can harvest it. And that's actually, people don't usually take much notice of that, but it's an important thing particularly if you're a northern grower like I am or if you're up in the mountains um, because you have a short season and you've got to think, okay, so what's the weather going to be like in October? Do you think I can harvest my squash? And it's like, well, I'll give it a, I'll give it a try, you know? Mm-hmm. The, the thing that's happening, though, at this time is that with these, this hot weather, it is harder to grow what you might call your leafy vegetables. Uh, the, the cabbage family, which are called brassicas, They like their roots pretty cool, and they like to actually um, start cool. So when you plant your seeds, you want to keep it cool. And so when when I plant seeds, I will cover them with what's called a row cover, which is an amazing stuff. It's it's spun polypropylene. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It looks like a, a fine white cloth with tiny little holes in it. And you just lay it over your garden, over your seeds, and you water through it so it doesn't disturb the soil so much, and it keeps it just that little bit cooler mm-hmm. and damper. And so you can get things to grow. The things which are hardest to grow, and if you can get them to grow, you're kind of a little bit of a miracle maker, which is spinach. And everybody loves their spinach, nice and fresh and small, but spinach actually um, needs a kind of period of very uh, cold when it's, when it's in seed form. And the only way to get your... Uh, spinach seeds to be growing in the summer. And this is kind of an interesting hint. It also works actually for some of the um, greens, salad greens, Mm -hmm. um, is to put it in the freezer for a week or two. Ah. I know, you wouldn't think of that. Yeah, you wouldn't think because, but then when you think about it, it's like, oh, well, I suppose in nature what would happen is it would set its seeds, the seeds would lie on the ground, the frost would come, They'd get covered with leaves, and then they'd start to come up in the spring. And some seeds need that period of frost, if you like. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we have artificial frost in our refrigerators and in our freezers, and we can do that. And you can – I've I've done – if you try to, in a hot day, try to sow your spinach seeds, you might be lucky enough to get 10% of them to germinate. If Even you if them, you put them in the freezer, like you said. No, if you put them in the freezer, you might get as much as 80%. Oh, okay. That'll be the difference. And, uh, you know, that's actually kind of a big difference. And you've got to keep them cool as they're growing. Mm-hmm. But uh, that, that's one of the little secrets of growing in the summer, is actually put your seeds, any seeds that you really want to, um, that are kind of what I call a cold-weather crop. And I don't know if you know what they're. They're mostly your leafy, leafy greeny-looking ones. Uh, like kale, like you were saying, and spinach. Yeah, kale. Uh, do you know kohlrabi, which is a, a kind of like a root? No, I don't it? believe I'm familiar with that. Oh, it's a wonderful vegetable. It's a, it's a very underused vegetable. You can see it sometimes in the stores. It's actually usually kind of golf ball or a little bit. No, not golf ball. I mean um, uh, softball or softball. bigger. Softball, okay. Yeah, and it's it can be green or it can be purple. The ones I grow are purple. They're very pretty. And it's got a kind of crunchy slightly cabbagey flavor. It's great in salads, uh, just eating it raw, but you can fry it up or you can you can uh, boil it. You can put it with other vegetables, great vegetables, very good value and easy to grow. And that's actually in the same family as the cabbages and the kales and the broccolis and the cauliflowers and uh, collards. Now, collards is a wonderful plant. Um, I don't know if you uh, have ever been down south. Oh, yeah, we've had the collard grains, that's for sure. 
Yeah, yeah you know, they, the Collard Greens is is really big down there, and I have some friends who actually come from Carolina, North Carolina, mm-hmm. and um, I give them the Collards because now you can grow just a couple of plants of Collards, and that will keep producing all through the summer. Mine are producing very well. You can have Collards whenever you want to, and they'll keep producing right into the winter. Mm-hmm. And if you start seeding them now, just a few plants, you, they will get through the winter with a little bit of protection, and you'll be having collards first thing in the spring, you know, when you really need those green vegetables. Uh, lovely. It's a great plant. And that's, a, that's an interesting one for me because, of course, where I came from in, in Ireland, uh, we'd never seen a collard. We didn't, that's, a, that's a completely different uh, cabbage-like plant. Mm-hmm. Very deep green, too, and that's the most important thing, I think, with uh, especially the leafy plants. People always think of salads. They tend to think of iceberg lettuce, which, well, <laughs> it's what it is. But, uh-huh. you know, the fact is is that these types of plants like collard greens or mustard greens, kale, spinach, right. they have such deep nutritional value, you know, and that's absolutely. something you really want to consider in your garden. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, back to the nutrition, yes. You know, you're always thinking about what is good nutrition. Um, when you're When you're growing your own greens, Kale and collards and broccolis. We we do what's called a sprouting broccoli. And that's an interesting one, which most people you can't find that in the stores, but it's easy to grow. That'll grow, you know. You can plant in the spring. You could plant it just about now or even later, and then it you take off the main broccoli and then it has little side shoots, and you keep taking off the side shoots, and that thing will keep um, producing broccolis for six months. And I'll be planting my new season of sprouting broccoli, and I'll be getting those in you know, February, probably, February, March. Um, and they will be wonderful. But that's what you're saying about the deep green, stronger flavors. Um, mm-hmm. You always have to look for flavor, because if you think about human beings, um, and it's a kind of a little miracle that we found the foods that we have found. Some of our ancestors must have gone around tasting everything. Yeah, probably got I always poisoned, wondered that you know? myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they would taste everything. They were probably very hungry. <laughs> and um, what they found is that, well, some things are good for you and some things aren't good for you. And there's certain flavors which actually tell you that things are good for you. Mm-hmm. And I think our taste has been degraded because of the food that we've been eating. But, you know, you can you can uh, start to think of your your tongue as a way of determining how much nutrition is in a plant. If it's got that strong, rich flavor, you know this has got a lot of minerals in it. Mm-hmm. And if you think of that, it's like, oh, that's interesting because you know we're designed, if you like, to taste good flavors. Trouble with our tongue, you can trick it. You can trick our tongue with sugars particularly. So, you know, you put in your... Um, you know, your corn syrup into things, and people get tricked into thinking that's got nutritional value. But, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't. Uh, you've got Generally, to be if you put corn syrup in something, it's probably in a product that's in a package or a box. That's right. That's right. And it's been manufactured. The taste has been manufactured. They, you know, they're, they're, they're very skillful in determining, okay, which tastes sell the best, and how do we create that taste with whatever we've got um, chemically? And then we know that we're going to get good value, if you like. We're going to get a good profit from selling this. But the person who's buying it isn't particularly getting any nutritional value. Mm-hmm. In some cases, maybe even turning into an addict. <laughs> well, that's right, you know. You, you, you look at, yeah, you look at uh, the obesity uh, um, you know, problem that we're having in this country at the moment, and uh, you wonder about the food that people are addicted to. Mm, exactly. Now, it's really uh, interesting because I also remember in the summertime uh, when I was in Texas and my mom had a little garden in the backyard that, mm-hmm. of course, you got pests. They're going to come in. Oh, you got right. bugs and you got different things. And I know up in the Northwest you could have a yard, raccoons, rabbits, you name it. So what do we do about this and try to avoid you know, using chemicals, for instance? Is there an organic approach to being able to protect your garden? There is, and I have to say this is one of the most difficult things about having an organic garden. Uh, you know, first of all, talking about your, your critters, you know, that's, that's um, you know, a, an ongoing problem for everybody. You have to know how do you keep away your, your critters. You, 
fencing, of course, is the easiest thing, and, and most people who have uh, big gardens have to do the fencing. But you know, hard to keep out raccoons, isn't it? And thank goodness I don't have raccoons. I just have bears, a um, uh-huh. little bigger than raccoons, but they tend not to eat many vegetables. <laughs> you know, here's uh, something somebody told me, and this was in relation to the fact that they had a koi and goldfish pond in their backyard. And, of course, raccoons would be notorious for going into a pond mm-hmm. and snatching up koi, and that can get pretty spendy. But he simply said, well, I went down to a uh, an outdoor sporting store, and I bought coyote pee for like mm-hmm. two bucks. Yeah. Yeah, then that, I sprinkled that, it around the pond. He says, I don't have any problems with raccoons. Right. I thought, well, that's kind of genius. Well, you know, that I've heard that. There's other things which I've heard, which is that actually a lot of these animals do not like, for instance, um, plastic or shiny surfaces. And I know somebody who puts around their tomato plants when they're, you know, getting ripe. They pl- put... Uh, like um, uh, kind of shiny sheets of stuff, which is slippery, mm-hmm. and the the raccoons don't like that. They oh. can't get their little feet to work. Oh, I <laughs> you know. I have yeah. I have these images of them kind of sliding, you know, around on the <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but so those those are the ones that are critters. I actually have uh, designed my own, um, you know, kind of getaway pest stuff for for, for the bit, the deer that come around here, mm-hmm. and. Um, it's it's based on a lot of similar ones that it has, but it works extremely well for me. And what I find is that I can train the deer. Deer actually tend, if you have deer, tend to go along paths, deer paths. And they, they wear these paths down, and they just tend to follow them, and they smell them, and they follow them. And year by year, they just will continue to go through your garden once they've found it. Mm-hmm. And what you want to do is persuade them to take another path. Uh, so I use a very simple mix, which is garlic, eggs, uh, hot pepper, that's the basis of it, and in water. Um, I add sometimes, because actually I have it, uh, some fish fertilizer, because they don't like the protein, so the eggs and the fish they don't like. And then the the secret uh, ingredient, which is Irish spring soap. (laughs) It's true. Of all the things that keep away deer, Irish spring soap is the most effective. Wow. I mix that in, and I spray that not on my garden. I'll, I'll spray it on the flower beds, but not on my vegetables. I'll spray it around, and I'll spray it where their paths are. Mm-hmm. So I'll give them, as they're coming along, not a particularly good experience if they eat anything. Mm-hmm. And so they'll tend to go around. But the Irish Spring, which you can actually buy in bulk, you know, from bulk stores, if I, I have tulips, and I live in the, in the mountains, and it's, I don't have any fencing, and I have lots and lots of tulips. And tulips are actually a deer, a deer food, which is their favorite. And what I do is I just take the Irish Spring soap and I grate it into the tulips as they come up. When they're just like a little cup shape of flowers uh, of uh, leaves, just a few uh, bits of Irish Spring in those, and then they'll go right through. And I'll get my tulips. That's funny. I just had this image of the movie Cool Hand Luke starring Paul Newman as he's escaping from the little working uh, prison uh-huh. farm, if you will, and had these bloodhounds after him, and he was oh, taking yes. for all kinds of stuff. And then there was a one point where he sprinkles all the pepper and cayenne pepper in the air I and see. runs through it, and the dog oh, just I remember lost that. it. It's a great movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, that's exactly what you need to, you to do. Um, you, I, there's, a, there's a recipe for it on my website under the articles. Uh, which is on bounty.com, B-O-U-N-T-E-A.com. And I found it extremely effective. I, I, you have to do it whenever it rains. That's the problem. You have to kind of renew it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's for your bigger critters. And then basically the, the simple ones, are the, when you're looking at you know, your little bugs, you use something actually that's quite similar. It seems as though things like um, garlic, Particularly, garlic is extremely good at uh, getting rid of your little tiny pests. Oh. Garlic, cayenne pepper, all of these organic uh, products have the same stuff. What you have to be very careful with these is that you don't overdo it because you can actually make it too strong. Right. And then soap, organic soap. You always want to use that because that spreads it out over the leaves and actually kind of if you've got like uh, green aphids, mm-hmm. it'll smother those green aphids a little bit. And then the strong oils are also useful. Things like peppermint oil or eucalyptus particularly. Mm -hmm. Those oils are really good. And if you buy these organic products and you look at the ingredients, you'll see that almost all of them have 
a similar or, or a kind of a slightly different mix of those ingredients. So you can actually make it yourself if you want to. Um, but there's getting to be new and better organic sprays, but you're always looking for things which basically, if you ate them, you'd know what they are and they wouldn't poison you. Mm-hmm. Very good. So, yeah, it's kind of good to look on the package. And if it's straightforward ingredients instead of multi-syllabled words, then you're going to stay pretty safe. But, you know, I was That's thinking nice. of aphids too, though. Wouldn't you want to produce maybe some ladybugs as well? Or? Mm, oh, yeah, well, we've got millions of ladybugs at the moment they, they, because uh, there's a funny um, – it goes, you know, one year you'll have lots of aphids. Then, actually, the next year you'll get more more ladybugs. Then you have a lot of ladybugs, no aphids, and then it goes back into the same cycle. There, there's a funny cycle with aphids and ladybugs, but uh, buying buying ladybugs is great, and there's a lot of these new – well, these insects that you can buy, you can buy uh, special nematodes, which are actually predatory. That means they're little kind of worm-like things you put in the soil, and they'll they'll kill off some of the bad nematodes. You can get little fly eggs, uh, not normal fly eggs, but these will be flies which will kill off caterpillars, for instance. Um, but you, you look in a good catalog, you'll find many, many different ones nowadays. It's getting more and more. You don't want to overdo any of those things. Mm -hmm. You want to keep them all at a minimum and let your own garden do what it can. And if you keep it healthy, it will actually keep out most of the bugs. I don't usually have bug problems. Well, that's great. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk and have, you know, my eyes open when it comes to gardening here and, you know, and just the true value that it gives to you and the joy and the... uh, and and the meditation that you can get. I mean, there's just so many elements. And then in the end, you also get to enjoy the bounty from what you get from your garden as well. And it must be exciting a lot of times when you get together with other white gardeners and just share ideas and stories about mm-hmm. what you do. So it's a big movement. It's gonna it's getting bigger and bigger across the whole states. I, mean, I mm-hmm. think there's, there's three times as many gardeners as there was three years ago. Well, people I think are also getting wise, as we've discovered here on the program about how a very small area of land, maybe not even the size of, you know, a standard size apartment living room, mm-hmm. can yield enough food not only for a family but for other people in the community as well. And when you start thinking at almost no cost over time that it just keeps giving and producing and giving, you know, why wouldn't you want to move in that direction? Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Why don't you go ahead and give a website out there, Roland, so people can find out more about uh, gardening, and, and you've got yeah. a lot of resources, I know, and, and, and things like that. Yes, uh, yeah, I write a monthly article for for a, a national magazine, and on my new, on the the website, it's www.bounty b o u n t e a bounty dot com, and I also do a newsletter every month, which actually gives you hints about what things to grow, and I think last last month it was actually on how to make compost, and the one before that on tomatoes. Um, and that can be useful for anybody. So I hope that will help people. Well, very good. Well, again, thank you, Roland Evans of Bounty, for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program and teaching right, us about keeping pleasure. the bugs out while keeping the good food in. <laughs> thank you very much, Daniel. You bet. Thank you again. Well, right. I also thank the listeners here for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at Beyond 50 radio.com and be sure to sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and uh, joining us here on the program today we're going to be talking about farming here uh, in the summertime I remember many years ago that I used to live right across the street from a dairy farm and I can tell you that no two farms are alike especially when it comes to the summertime and I believe Jacqueline Freeman are you here on the line I am here. Good. Wanted to be sure about that. Had just a slight delay there, but I know that uh, uh, that uh, Friendly Haven Farm, which is located in southwest Washington, is one of those, uh, I guess, agriculturally sustainable farms where people can kind of come and participate, but depending on their farming experience. So you must be getting some really interesting people that show up to help you out there on the farm. Tell us about that. We have. We've had, let me see, we just had the most wonderful woman who is here from Norway and she was great, and it was so interesting because she would she would go through the garden and she recognized a lot of plants, but they were a little different than they are in Europe. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> that was really fun for both of us, uh, and and even some of the same plants we have, but with different names. Mm-hmm. So that was great, and we've we've had a um, a winemaker here who's been learning what happens on a farm in not wine season, and that's been really enjoyable too. 
Um, so, yeah, all kinds of different people. Every few weeks we've got a few more. Now, what's really interesting for you and your experience on the farm in the summertime that makes it really stand out versus the other seasons? Oh, my gosh. I, I don't even shop anymore at the market. <laughs> <laughs> we we do our meat. What do you um, mean sales tax? I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> yeah, we do our meat year-round. So we've got freezers that are full of, uh, you know, beef and and lamb and chicken and turkeys and um, and pork. I get the lamb and and the pork from my girlfriends. We just trade. So we've got we've actually got four freezers. <laughs> wow. Full. So that carries us through on that end. And then the gardens themselves. Oh my gosh. I you know that's the most fun. I start out in the in the early part of the day, and I haven't got a clue what we're going to do for breakfast or uh, dinner or lunch. And we just walk out in the garden and go, oh, raspberries are in. Well, you know, let's make up some yogurt tonight. And, you know, we've got, there's our breakfast stuff handled. And, um, you know, lunch is uh, salad, salad, salad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And the thing I like about salads is they start early in the season in in, um, spring, and we just keep them going. They're all wearing little tent hats right now. We have roofs over them made out of uh, just a very thin, flimsy kind of a cloth so that they don't get the hot, burning summer sun. Mm-hmm. And that keeps them from going bitter and going to, to bolt as well. That was, yeah, that was one of the things that our uh, last guest was talking about is how you kind of want to create you know, shade and, and ways that direct sunlight, as he was saying, the ultraviolet rays during the summertime are a lot harsher on plants, so you want to really have a good combination of shade working in their favor to keep them cool so they don't get too wasted from the heat. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, And they've done well. They've done really well. And, of course, one thing that makes a huge difference is the quality of the soil. We have really good soil in our garden beds. We've been working on it for years and years, supplementing it with our compost and oh, and seaweeds and you know, all kinds of interesting things like he was talking about. And then um, that helps a lot because we just came out of a week of really, really hot temperatures here, Un- mm-hmm. unusually hot for southwest Washington. And uh, we have our you know, our plants on a little bit of irrigation first thing in the morning, right about dawn. And that just held them right through the day. And, you know, the rest of them don't have the roofs over, the little cloth roofs over them. So um, that, I was really hoping everything was going to make it. You know, you keep your fingers crossed when you get temperatures that are 20 degrees higher than what your normal summer temperatures mm-hmm. are. And everything did just fine, just fine. And it, that's not just the fact that it got water. It's the fact that the roots are so nourished by the soil that they're just strong. I think what's really interesting, too, Jacqueline, about the summertime is that your days are a lot longer. <laughs> and, you know, and I think what makes it interesting from this point of view is that as you're out on a farm, you have basically natural laws and natural entertainment going on. As you're out engaged in the farming process, you realize your day seems to go on forever, but you never really feel bored. Oh, my gosh, there's so much to do, and it's so enjoyable. It really is. I mean, there's there's a lot of work that's hard. We were cutting blackberries last night, and the Northwest blackberries can be quite invasive. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, but you do it with a bunch of friends, and we try and do it that way, and that just makes it so much more enjoyable. The one thing I can say, though, is these long, late nights. <laughs> ah. We don't come in, uh, you know, we're used to not coming in until we're done working. Mm-hmm. And, boy, when it doesn't get dark till after 9 o'clock, <laughs> dinner's going to be really late. Mm-hmm. So we we try and, you know, by 6 o'clock we try and remind ourselves to go in and have something to eat. But I'll tell you, five out of seven nights we're eating dinner at 10 o'clock. Ah. <laughs> and enjoying yourself, too, especially as the moon comes out. It's really nice. Yeah. Now, as I was alluding to earlier, um, my parents still live across the street from the dairy farm that I was talking about there. And one of the uh, most interesting times is the summertime because that's usually when they're also bailing and, and stacking hay. So I'd always get that phone call, hey, would you like to earn some money? And sure enough, you know, you're <laughs> jumping on the hay truck. And, but, you know, I tell even my own children, I said, that was such a neat experience. It was hard work, but it was enjoyable because you've seen a definite time that it was going to end. It's when you were done clearing a field. But mm-hmm. sometimes these fields could be up to 15 miles away. 
Oh, now just imagine a cart can only hold so much hay, and then you've <laughs> got to take it back and maybe make two or three trips. Mm-hmm. So you're really doing the hay ride, so to speak. <laughs> oh, what fun. Yeah, we just did our haying. Um, and, yeah, there, uh, you, try to, you try to clear it on a day that's not too, too hot. Right. And you try to time it so that you don't lose your hay. We, we happen to have a banner year for our first cutting of hay. Uh, more more bales than we've ever gotten off of that field, and we just missed it on the tail end. We got rain, and uh, it just wasn't quite dry. We were pushing it a little bit, and oh well. So on the plus side, though, we said, well, this will be the opportunity to make the hugest compost piles we've made yet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did with Sort of it. like the Iowa Corn Mountains? <laughs> oh, man, they, and they are mountains. So that's uh, turning into compost. Now, that's something we've had on our list for the last few years was to make bigger, bigger, bigger piles of compost for the, to nourish the fields, the mm-hmm. pastures. And now we have our opportunity. We had about two minutes where we were, oh, dear, what a terrible thing. We just lost all of our, our, our first cutting of hay. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we said, oh, okay, this is what you do with it. Nothing goes to waste on a farm. You know, it's interesting you should bring that up, Jacqueline, about the idea that you're in this process and you're about ready to, to reap a reward here and then something comes in and just takes it right out of your hands. And I'm reminded of a guest that we had on our program, I believe it was about a month ago, the Lavender Queen, where they started a lavender farm in Texas. And she was talking about it's interesting when people start farming. Whatever it is, it could be you could be a vegetable gardener or you can have cows, whatever the case is. She says, but natural laws apply themselves when they feel like it. The question is, <laughs> do you have resiliency and can you adapt? What's been your experience? Oh, she is right on the money with that one. <laughs> Especially if it's a lavender queen in Texas. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. So, yes, we, we have things like that we have to deal with all the time. And, you know, we have a, a whiteboard that we keep up that's got the tasks that we can predict that we have to do. And then it's got the things that actually happen that day that need immediate attention. Like, uh, oh, did you hear about our cow? No. Oh, we had a we have one of our dairy cows, and uh, we as farmers we never leave. <laughs> we mm-hmm. never go away because there's too many tasks that need to be done that you know we're kind of we're in charge of that we do, like milking mm-hmm. the cow, and we milk by hand and. So we, um, I had a, uh, I got invited to a sustainability fair to teach a bee class, and I really wanted to go to it. So we trained our interns to take over all of the overview tasks that we, that my husband and I do. So we scooted on down to Central Oregon to teach that, and we we had not even been there, but a few hours, and uh, we got a call from our interns who said that Miss Amelia had a hundred uh, over a hundred porcupine quills in her forehead. Ooh. <laughs> Ow. We call and of course it was a Sunday. Of course it was a Sunday, <clears throat> so we called our vet and he said, you know, I'm gonna do the same thing you do. I'm just gonna take a pair of pliers and pull them out. But better that you do them fast faster than later. Right. So uh which meant that we had to do something you know, we, we were hours away drive time, so it wouldn't have even helped us to turn around and come back. So we got our wonderful neighbor, Brenda, uh, to come over, and she said, oh, I picked so many porcupine quills out of dogs' noses, I think I can handle it. So mm-hmm. she came over, and our farm interns helped, and they they pulled 147 quills out. Now, My goodness. The, the, the funny thing about it is, if it was curiosity, it would have been quills in the nose, because you go up and you sniff it. Mm-hmm. Not with my cow. My cow had him in her forehead. That meant <laughs> she was trying to squash the porcupine. Really? So she does have a new calf, so she was probably uh, being protective, but she was trying to squash the porcupine with her forehead, with her horns. Um, obviously, the porcupine got away because there was no porcupine out in the field anywhere, and, uh, and no one around here had even seen a porcupine in 20 years. Wow. One of my, one of my friends sent me a, a short little email. I have something up on the website with pictures of her before and after. And uh, she sent me a one-word email that said, porcupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> Sustainably organic practices for getting your chi to move, if not the rest of your body anyway. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, after, we, after they got all of the uh, porcupine quills out, I called them back and I said, you know, put some clay on it. Draw if there's any little poison left in there. 
it'll draw it out. So they made up a mud mask with clay, and they put it all over her face. And, you know, we came, we got home later that night, and she was so happy. I'll bet. <laughs> she was so happy. We gave her another clay mask the next day. I think she thought it was like a little spa treatment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, see, and those are the kind of things when you share stories like that about being on a farm, and you take a look at a society today that seems so wired into technology in such a way that we constantly have to find ways to entertain ourselves through that medium rather than slowing things down and, for instance, putting a nice little clay mask on a cow because it got wiped out by a porcupine and you think, that's even stranger than fiction. (laughs) (laughs) You You couldn't make that up. (laughs) <laughs> no, you couldn't. <laughs> now, you know, you mentioned earlier, too, because I, I do know that as we have had you on the program before, you talked about bees, and it's interesting because, like, for instance, in our front yard, I've kind of let it go as far as my grass doesn't look like everybody else. Everybody else, it's like astroturf. It's kind of green to brown. It's like carpet oh, out in the front yard. But mine, I kind of let the weeds come in over the years, but now you're seeing more flowers and things like that come into the yard. And I notice what's really neat about that is there's a lot of aliveness. I got little black and gold bumblebees and regular bees, and you just watch them as they do their thing, and it's like the yard just comes alive versus what seems to be pretty yards surrounding me, but virtually dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. You can you, you walk out there and see little garter snakes and mm-hmm. um, you know all kinds of things around, we, all kinds of little bugs here and there. And, oh, it's wonderful. I love it. I just love it. <laughs> so what is summer care for bees like? Because I know that you do have bees, uh, pretty much your own hives that you set up there. Well, I'll tell you something funny about the bees right now. All of my squash are coming in, and I've got, oh, let me see, acorn squash, butternut, hubbard, turban squash, and, of course, the ubiqu- ubiquitous zucchini, uh, and they're all coming in. But I have bees, which means they've gone, they visited every flower one after another, So they've hybridized all of my squash. And we have the funniest time. I'll pick one up, and it'll look like kind of like a turban squash, but it's kind of got a butternut shape on the bottom. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what it is. Or there'll be a a zucchini that's actually blue, like the blue Hubbard. (laughs) Wow. It's just funny as as all get out. And, you know, we just have the greatest time trying to figure out, why do you think this is? It's Mm -hmm. a squash, but what kind do you think it could be? They do a wonderful job out there, and they're on everything. Bee care in the summertime, you know, people can help take care of bees even if they're not, you know, if they don't have bees themselves because the bees will travel a mile or two looking for anything. If you have flowers in your yard, bees will probably visit it. Mm -hmm. And you can help a lot uh, just by doing um, two simple things. One is plant a lot of herbs in your yard, flowering herbs, because they use them as medicinals. And this is the time of year when, you know, my oreganos and my sages and rosemaries and everything are just full out, covered with the, with the bees. And people don't often know that. You know, a flower they go to get the nectar from to make the honey. But the herbs are even more important because they give them the medicinals that they need, and they know when they need it. Mm-hmm. So they'll come get it and bring it back to the hive. That's really good. The second one is providing water stations because so much gets dry in the summertime. And if you put out little water stations here and there, they can just be bowls filled with water. But what you do want to do, bees fly, um, they'll, they'll come in, and if they land in the water, they get stuck. I, you know, if you have a swimming pool, you know this. Mm-hmm. They get out of the water by pushing their wings down, and they can't do that if they're floating in water, so they'll drown. So what I do all around here, we have um, stock tanks for our cows and you know, big big water dishes um, for our chickens and things. And what I do is I put anything that's got a large size to it, which is over a few inches, um, and if it's a, got a little bit of depth to the water, then I put sticks in it. And I put sticks that have a fork in them because mm-hmm. if you just throw a few sticks in there, the bees will try and climb up on it, but it's like the, the log rolling for the lumberjacks. Ah, so that's why you have a fork stick. I got Yeah, you. and a fork stick that they can climb right up on and get out. Or here in the northwest, we have a lot of moss around, and you know it kind of dries up in the summertime, but that doesn't matter. I just take a handful of moss and put it right in the dish, and that way they can land on the moss, and they can just kind of trundle on down and get their little tongues down to the water without having to get their bodies or their feet wet. <laughs> that's so cute. 
<laughs> it is. And in the shade, preferably in the shade, but, um, you know, just so the water doesn't get too hot. But what they'll do is they see them when they fly over, so the water will give a reflection, and that kind of catches their attention, and it will wow. call it over there. I just got a call last about a week or two ago from a woman who thought she had bees, an elderly woman who thought she had bees somewhere in her yard. And I went over there and looked, and I said, gosh, you don't have bees. But actually, the farmer who lives not 400 yards away on the other side of the fence and kind of up the road, I drove around the neighborhood, and I said, he's got bees, and your little water garden with the fountain and the water lilies in it, that's their watering station. <laughs> ah. So what we did was just rearranged her yard a little bit so that the bees weren't coming next to her um, where her chair and tables for sitting out uh, table and chairs were for sitting out. We just moved it so that um, the the place where they're getting the water was on the far side of the garden. So that was something that she was surprised about. She said, but I have so many here. I have to have these somewhere. I said, yeah, but they're over there. And ah. <laughs> <laughs> they're just coming over here because you're the nearest wonderful water station. So I suggested to her, too, she might want to go over and talk to him and suggest that he puts out a water station for his bees so they don't have to travel all the way over to her yard. Mm -hmm. But water this time of year is really important to them. For those of you just joining us, we're talking with Jacqueline Freeman of Friendly Haven Farm about what really goes on when it's midsummer on a farm, and it's a lot more entertaining than one can even imagine. Porcupine <laughs> quills in the forehead of a cow making a nice, beautiful clay cow mask to maybe draw out the poison so the cow feels happier. Playful bees, getting them to drink without drowning, and much, much other things. Now, what about weeds? You know, I think, as like I was mentioning about the yards in the neighboring area, they're like totally weed-free, but it's huh. there's just no animation in their yard. It's like it looks like a nice car, but you could take a vacuum out and, I guess, pick up the dirt. But, you know, what about weeds? Are there? It's like all weeds are bad for these people. You know, that's so... It's something that I think people don't, they're not aware of about weeds. Weeds only grow where they're needed, and every weed has a purpose. Right. So the the easiest one to talk about is cat, is the uh, dandelion. Right, because that's the most dandelion. abundant. Right, mm -hmm. and people run around and they're spraying chemicals on their dandelions, and they're trying to get rid of them. And, oh, my gosh, look at a dandelion when it goes into the fluff puffball stage, you know, it's sending mm -hmm. out, what, <laughs> a few hundred little seeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm you know when I was younger I did the same thing. My neighbor one time shamed me into you know digging out dandelions in my yard, and I I did. I went out there and I dug all the dandelions up. Now I got to tell you, not that it made one bit of difference the next day. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but as I learned more about what the purpose of the weeds are, gosh, it, it just completely changed my thoughts about them. What dandelions are doing is they grow in calcium poor soil. And they send a long taproot root down. Everyone knows they have a long root. They're hard to dig up. Mm -hmm. And that taproot is way down deep, and it's mining calcium. They're miners. They're mining calcium, sending it up through its root, putting the calcium out in the flower and the, and the leaves. And then when they die back, it deposits that calcium into the top of the soil. So you could kill those dandelions forever, but as long as, you have, as, long as you're missing calcium in the soil, you're going to have them coming back. As soon as you balance your soil well enough, you don't have those kind of problems. Or if well, what's you want to call it a problem. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, too, if this is true, because I've heard this over and over. Now, here you have this very common weed, the dandelion. Everybody knows what it looks like. It's got the long yellow flower, and, you know, it's the long neck, and then, of course, it has the little white fluff ball as kids. You'd pick it up and blow it like a candle. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that you can actually eat these or actually have them as part of your diet. Well, the first ones to eat them are the bees because they are, <laughs> they're actually the one that starts the honey flow season when they come out in early, you know, pretty, well, kind of middle spring. But once the dandelions are out, the bee, the bee season is underway. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yes, we can too. And they're, uh, in spring, you can pick them. We do. We steam them up, mm -hmm. a little bit of garlic and olive oil. They're delicious mm -hmm. and so good for you, filled with vitamins. I wish more people knew about that. But I do hope what you brought up there is really good. I wish um, more people would take a look at the weeds and find out, you know, what is it that they, not just as medicinals, but also what is it that um, weeds are doing for the soil. Mm -hmm. Even um, like thistle, for example. You know, everybody thinks, oh, thistle, how terrible. But what thistles do is they send down a taproot that breaks up compacted soil. 
if you've got thistles. You've got soil that's too compacted. It needs to be aerated and, you know, loosened up. And when you have looser soil, you don't have thistles. <laughs> ah, interesting. Yeah, so forget the chemicals. Just uh, heal what the soil is calling for. Because mm-hmm. you could always just kind of go in, especially if you've got a nice backyard, let's say, infested with the dandelions or, as you said, thistle. Just rototill it, and you're actually starting to rebuild your soil. Yeah, we don't even rototill, though. We do we do no-till. Um, we just work right on top of it. You know, and I even think, you. I wonder if you've ever had anybody on talking about that, because that would make a good topic for you. I think um, it actually would, too. Yeah, and if people want to start a garden, rather than going right into the ground, what we do when we start our new gardens is we throw down a few sheets of cardboard, and then we put our, our, um, our compost and our mulch right on top of it, there's a great book called Lasagna Gardening that <laughs> is so funny. And that woman just was looking for what's the easiest way I can get a garden going mm-hmm. and the lowest cost and the lowest labor. And she builds what she calls lasagna beds because they're just layers of leaves and kitchen compost and, you know, <laughs> everything, you know, mm-hmm. top, uh, apple cores. And, you know, she just throws everything in there, clippings from the from the lawn grass and well, I was going to mention something, too, if I may, Jacqueline. Our former guest, Roland, was talking about anything that is in nature, and that even includes the food you eat. If you're done, don't throw it away. You just throw it in the compost pile. He, says he, he throws it all in there. That, exactly, and that's lasagna gardening, and you just mm-hmm. start a new bed by building up on that. And what happens is as everything rots down or it composts, it builds great soil. And over oh. a longer term, that cardboard on the bottom, it will take that a few months to do that, maybe a season or two even, to rot down. But by that time, you've built up this kind of great soil on the top that you can plant into, and you've suppressed some of the weeds that are underneath, and then you've provided this nice aerated loose soil on the top, so you don't have right. to rototill to break it up. Isn't that oh. easy? That's yeah. interesting. I would have never even thought of something like that. Yeah, hmm. It's the, the lazy gardening way, and it truly works. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for those who have just moved out of state into another state, you don't know what to do with all those empty yeah. U-Haul boxes. Yeah. <laughs> Start a garden. <laughs> now, what about people who visit the farm? What are some of the things they do when they're they're out there at the farm with you? I mean, it sounds like there's quite a bit to do, and there's never a every, task left unturned. Every day is different. <laughs> And when people come and stay with us here, we we take a few guests at a time, uh, and they just take part in you know going out in the garden and picking what we're going to make for lunch, and uh, you know, and then we we might be going out and working with um, we've, right now we're working with teaching our calf how to halter train so that we can walk her around and you know and just getting her ready for the day when she's going to become our next milk cow. Oh, um, well, collecting up our chickens and. Uh, and eggs and, you know, doing, you can probably hear in the background right now. I've got <laughs> <laughs> Either that or you have a special sound effect so people believe you're on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear that? That's what a chicken does right after she's laid the biggest, best egg ever. <laughs> That's a chicken. Okay. That's a chicken right now, and she's she's just telling everybody. Can you hear her? Yeah, I can. I was thinking it was a rooster for some reason. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that is. Biggest, best egg ever laid. Come and see. Come and see. <laughs> <laughs> and it ain't going to an Easter cause either, that's for sure. <laughs> well, see, and that's one of those elements, though, when you think about farming and people who are so used to the technological city sort of living out, always constantly finding ways to <clears throat> stimulate themselves, to keep themselves, you know, kind of going and happy and uh, avoiding boredom is that when you're on a farm, even though the days are long, it doesn't seem like there's ever a lack of entertainment or things to do that is enjoyable, and it just really makes for a very useful day, which is what a lot of people, I think, really want. You are absolutely right with that. I, I have so many times during the day where I just look at what I'm doing and go, I love this. I love this life. It is. It's wonderful. And the animals, the plants, the bees, everybody just makes it. You're so much more in touch with nature. You know, this, mm-hmm. this is, I really believe this is what we're meant to be doing mm-hmm. being in touch with nature and just appreciating everything that's around us well tell people about a website they can go to to find out more about your farm and what kind of resources are available on that website 
Sure. Uh, the website is, our, our farm is called Friendly Haven Rise, and our website is friendlyhaven.com. Uh, I live in a tiny little village of Venersburg, and that's uh, in Swedish that means a haven for friends. So our website is friendlyhaven.com. And I've also got a blog. You can click right over there, um, over to it from that main website. Um, and in there, we I just kind of post as I go. So, uh, and, and oh yeah, we do have information about classes we do. That's up there. And uh, if people want to come and visit and be a guest here, <laughs> I say guest very loosely. Yes, we do have hammocks. They can rest in the hammocks, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's not really like you know, that you're just going to come and be entertained. You actually get your hands dirty while you're here. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, that's what more people need to do anyway is to appreciate the yeah. bounty that the earth gives it to them, you know, and, and it brings on a kind of happiness that it seems so few people actually really get to experience these days. Yeah, our last one of our last guests here, we actually had a, a three, a, a, two sisters, a brother, and his wife all came, and they kind of did their family thing here. And they spent three days, and the the brother took 256 photographs that were exquisite and sent them to me. He said, normally I don't take that many, but there was so much to see. And they were mm. beautiful photographs, too. And it opened my eyes up to even some of the things that I can get in the habit of taking for granted, and seeing just phenomenal beauty around us every day. Well, Jacqueline Freeman, thank you again for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program, and please go ahead and give out your website one more time. That's FriendlyHaven.com, and all kinds of pictures, all kinds of stories, including the one about our cow getting porcupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> porcupuncture. Sounds like a whole new industry. Yeah, really. That's what I would call a, a natural, all-organic way of acupuncture, that's for sure. <laughs> well, Jacqueline, again, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh huh. Well, want to also thank you, the listeners out there. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to also visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 5050. And also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter where we have all those kinds of resources, just like Friendly Haven Farm, right at your fingertips to also share with other people. Thank you again for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.